before I get into this video, I just wanted to say this video is dedicated to my best friend, Barbie. And the reason being that I chose this video to dedicate to her because there's another story that I'm planning on doing a, a video about that is uh, that I know is of very high interest to her. But this one is also concerning the Great Smoky Mountains and this is one of her favorite places to visit. She's the inspiration really for these videos that I started this channel because I would make videos specifically just for her and it just became a hobby. It became an interest. It's something that she and I have in common, which we have a lot in common, and we've been friends since we were very young children. And as the years have passed and we have gotten slightly older, we speak almost on a daily basis. And um, I just wanted to dedicate this video to her because this is about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And Barbie's very interested in disappearances in the national parks. This one in particular is about a young teenage girl who seemed to have her life together for a 15-year-old. She had a job. She was um, looking forward to getting her driver's license, and her parents were going to help her to purchase a car. She had plans of where she wanted to go to college and what she wanted to study. She was very interested in agriculture and she went on this field trip with her classmates from her high school. Her father reported that she wasn't really looking forward to this trip that she had really thought because the weather had been bad for a few days, it had been rainy that she thought that they were probably not going to go on this field trip, but they did. And whatever happened to this young girl that day is still a mystery. There have been a lot of speculation and theories over the years as to what happened to this girl. Um, some people believe she was abducted. That seems to be the, the theory that the FBI came up with. But the one thing that I did rule out very early on in reading and researching about this is a runaway. She was not, she did not fit that category. This girl had her own money. She worked and she was saving her own money. Um, if she had been planning to run away, she would not have spent a, quite a bit of money on a piece of jewelry that will come up later in this story. That's a key component to this story, in my opinion. And um, But I just want to dedicate this to my friend, and I hope that everyone else enjoys it as well. This is one of those cases that seems almost, and key, let, me, let me just say this before I say anything more. If not for this jewelry, if not for this girl's, some of this girl's personal belongings turning up later. This would almost come across as a vanishing. And I'm, I know there are people out there who, who believe in the bizarre and the macabre and they think that there is more going on here. I've had people comment stuff as Bigfoot captured someone. I've had people say it was aliens. I've had people say it was a wolf man, <laughs> a wolf person. Um, and then I've heard, I've had people say God protected these people, the ones that turned back up, like this little girl, Catherine Van Oust, that I did a video about. She was lost in the um, very rough terrain in the, wilderness in Arkansas for five or six days before she reappeared and a lot of people say that it was God or a, a guardian angel of some kind that protected her that's very possible 
I don't usually get into those types of thoughts. My thoughts and theories are usually human related. But if it was not for the jewelry, this girl's belongings turning up in the hands of some people that were there that day, I would say that this is one of the most bizarre, unexplained disappearances that I've read about and that I've studied about. Just because she was there one second and gone the next. I chose this case to dedicate to my friend because we were teenagers together. We were, we were young, 14, 13, 14, 15 year old teenagers together as friends and it was just kind of a, while we were a little later than the 70s, we, we were not, we were babies, we were toddlers during when the time that this all took place. But I'll get on with this story now and I hope that everyone enjoys it. On October the 8th, 1976, 16 year old Trini Gibson attended a class field trip to the Smoky Mountains National Park. She disappeared from a trail and was never seen again. Trini was interested in horticulture and the natural world and hoped to study landscape architecture in college. The students in her class were uncertain about their field trip for that day as it was gloomy and rainy. However, when the bus arrived at the head of the trails, all were eager to go hiking. As the students hiked, they separated into small groups. Notably, the teacher, Mr. Dunlap, was the only adult on the trip with 40 students. It was impossible to keep track of everyone. Trini and her friend Robert set off on a trail together. They stopped to eat lunch, and when it began to rain, Robert gave Trini his plaid jacket. When she wanted to hike again, Robert said he wanted to stay at their spot a bit longer, and Trini went off on her own. She passed another group of hikers on the trail and allegedly turned to her right, bent down to look at something on the ground, and then stepped off the trail and disappeared. She was never seen again. A student that passed by where Trini was last seen said there was no there was nowhere to go there. The, there was thick shrubbery and no trail. So there was nowhere for her to step out of like off the trail she would have had to have gone into the brush the shrubs as the group gathered back at the bus to get ready to go back someone asked where's Trini Robert told Mr. Dunlap that she had wanted to hike while he sat resting so he let her go off on her own and had not seen her since the group had never the group had not seen her either and stated that they assumed she would return to the bus. As in most of these unsolved cases, the weather made the search nearly impossible. The rain made the ground slippery, and one searcher slipped and fell, breaking several ribs. Cigarette butts were found, along with a partial can of beer, near the place where she was last seen. Even though the search through the park yielded nothing, her belongings began surfacing among her classmates. Her friend Robert was found to have her comb and had been given to her by her mother. Another girl found with a few pieces of her jewelry, though she refused to state how she got the jewelry and she never returned them. These students were all cleared as suspects in her disappearance. No trace of Trini has ever been found and her case remains unsolved. Uh, she was five foot three and a hundred and fifteen pounds. She was a white female with brown hair and green eyes. She was said to be wearing a blue blouse, a blue and white striped sweater. She was wearing a brown plaid jacket that belonged to her classmate, blue jeans, blue Adidas shoes, and a diamond and star sapphire ring. Sixteen-year-old sophomore was last seen hiking in the Smokies with a group from Bearden High School in Knoxville. Gibson was last seen by her fellow student from Andrews Ball to the Clingman's Dome parking area. I can't imagine her carrying a comb around in her hand. 
Although in that time, a lot of people did carry combs in their pockets. That was kind of a a fashion look. Uh, but on a hike, I agree, it would be somewhat strange to carry your comb with you on a hike. Is it possible that she asked the young man to carry her comb in his pocket and that he pulled it out of his pocket when he got back to the school and this is why he had her comb? That's somewhat strange. I don't know how old you are, but in the 70s, we strove to carry combs in our back pockets. Now, keep in mind, I'm not from the 1970s. My, my teenage years were toward the middle to late 80s, and so maybe that wasn't. But I do remember people carrying combs in their pockets. Um, the bigger the comb, the better. It was a fashion statement. Um, for those with curly hair, a lot of people carried bigger combs, and they said this was the type of comb that she had. It was said that she had long and very thick, wavy hair, so she always had a comb with her, but like the lady in this scenario said, would she have been carrying it with her on this hike? Okay, I'm convinced. This is from a comment. That was from June of 2013. I'm convinced that Simpson killed Trini and raped her, probably kept the comb as a trophy. I'm not sure about the logis logistics of how he got rid of the body. Either he hid her somewhere and went back to, to bury her. I don't believe that. If it's possible that he may have attacked her and killed her, the brush and stuff being so thick, he may have pushed her body into a wooded area and just quickly ran away leaving his coat behind because you know he had taken it off to attack and rape her as some people said but um would they not have found her body later after they went back to search it was only recently that i learned on web sleuths that someone had her jewelry in their possession I was always leaning toward this being an abduction, but if someone had her jewelry, it means that she either handed it to them or they took it from her. I don't know what they did with her remains or how they got her out of that park. So there, this person is suggesting that the kids ganged up on her and killed her. I wish cadaver dogs had been brought in or dog, search dogs had been brought in. Uh, the National Park Service was very resistant to anything like that. Um, Friday, October the 8th, 1976, was an ordinary mid-autumn day in Knoxville, Tennessee. It had rained during the night, but as daybreak neared, the rain tapered off and the humidity hovered at around 96%. That morning, Teresa Lynn, Trini Gibson, got up and got ready to go to school and prepared for a long bus ride. There was a field trip planned to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for a horticulture class high school junior was enrolled in. Despite her long-term goal to study landscape architecture at the University of Tennessee, on this day, her short-term wish was that this field trip would be canceled. Days earlier, she and her father had discussed their mutual misgivings about this trip. Trini was so confident that the outing would be canceled due to the weather that she did not dress for a hike that day. Instead, she chose an all-blue ensemble, including Adidas tennis shoes. From a distance of more than four decades, it seems that her ensemble was selected to showcase the $600 sapphire, diamond ring, sapphire and diamond ring that she wore to school that day. Now that right there could be an incentive or a motive. Um, the $600, was a, that's a lot of money now, but that was a lot of money for a necklace or jewelry at that time, a ring, rather. 
She had bought for herself for money that she had saved from her job at Morrison's cafeteria. When Trini finally did leave for school, no one, not her mom, nor her dad, or her brothers, thought that this would be the last time that they would ever see her. When Trini Gibson may have harbored the hope that the field trip would be canceled by the time she arrived at school, the weather had improved and the field trip was going to happen after all. She got on the bus and sat next to her friend Robert Simpson. No one at that time noticed anything problematic with her behavior. Somewhere around 12.30 that afternoon, the bus, along with the driver Wayne Dunlap, the teacher, had organized the trip. The students arrived at Klingman's Dome parking lot in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The parking lot was near the Forney Ridge Trail, a 1.8 mile route that the students would be taking to Andrews Bald and back. Trini seemed to have made it to Andrews Bald and was about three quarters of a mile from the parking lot when she was last seen by multiple classmates. By then, she was wearing a brown plaid coat that she had borrowed from Robert Simpson, her schoolmate, on the trip. Multiple students saw her stop to look at something as they were all headed toward the bus. She was never seen again. Her disappearance was first noted about 30 minutes after she was last seen. The students had all gotten back to the bus and when no one could find her, the teacher and another student hiked the trail back that she was last known to have been on. When the teacher determined that she was missing, he contacted the park and filed a, a report at about 4.30 p.m. Soon after, the bus, minus Trini and Mr. Dunlap, headed back to Knoxville, so he had stayed behind and allowed the school bus driver to take the other children back. The school bus carrying the students arrived back at the school as scheduled, and school officials had to tell the Gibsons that their daughter was not on the bus. Mr. Gibson had just gotten back from a business trip from Baton Rouge, and he and his wife packed up their family and headed to the Smoky Mountains to try to find news of their daughter. Both the media and search responses were robust, even by today's standards. The Gibson's wait and search effort continued to stretch for days. When the National Park Service and the National Guard had done all they could, the search was trimmed. The Gibson's went back to Knoxville. What Trini left behind was her savings passbook that showed that even after her jewelry purchase, she still had over $2,000 her purse, and other jewelry, a warm coat, and her much-beloved dog. While a few of her classmates thought it possible that she had run off, her parents thought she had been abducted. The FBI agreed with their conclusion, but it wasn't because of what she left behind, it was because of what she didn't leave behind. In all of the searching that was done for Trini Gibson, not one scrape of fabric could be linked to the clothes that she was said to have been wearing. Now this girl didn't run away because if she had over $2,000 in a savings account, she definitely would have taken that. And instead of spending $600 on a ring for herself, that was also money that she would have taken. This girl was planning to go to college, so she had a good head on her shoulders and she knew what she wanted to do. And maybe Maybe also, some people in the school might have seen her as thinking she was better, or she wears this ring to school, maybe she's bragging about the price, and maybe somebody said, you know, I could pawn that and get me some money for something that I'd like to have. I don't know. But the FBI says that they found no traces, not even one scrape of fabric. This tells that a person, if it were not for the jewelry that turned up in the hands of her classmate and the comb that turned up in the hands of the classmate who had spent the day with her and was last seen with her, 
I had this one theory that he alone did something to this girl, possibly raped her, uh, strangled her, disposed of her remains, stole her belongings. Uh, he had he said that he had loaned her his coat, his jacket, because his was um, because she wasn't wearing one, and it got kind of chilly that day. It had been raining. So he loaned her his jacket. That's the story that he told. But is it possible that that jacket was disposed of because it had her blood on it? That's another theory. Another strange thing about this story is about a year before um, Trini went missing, her mother shot an intruder. He was a high school student that attended school with Trini and her brother, and his name was Kelvin Bowman. Now, she shot him in the foot, and he was arrested and went to jail, and it was said that in the courtroom when he was being sentenced that he made threats against Trini and said that he would kill her when he was released from jail. The day that the students were traveling to the, to the Great Smoky Mountains on the bus for the field trip, some students reported that they saw his car following them, but the principal at the school later said that was not him. He was at the school in class. Um, he had went to jail. He had been sentenced, so I think they said to two years, but he had only served six months, got out, and went back to the school. Now, if there was any problems between him and Trini after he was released from jail, I don't, I didn't see anything about that. Um, I believe it's possible that some students on the bus just said this, and it could have been that one in particular student led the others to believe that, said that they saw this, and then the other students agreed to it, that they saw this Kelvin Bowman's car, but the um, principal said there was, you know, he was in class, so it couldn't have been him. That was just another strange thing about this um, story. It also reported that Robert Simpson during the time in the days after her disappearance, when the family had been in the Smoky Mountains searching for her, he had showed up at her home on two different occasions accusing Kelvin Bowman and saying that Kelvin Bowman had her and that he had probably kidnapped her. And um, he made this statement, a very strange and odd statement to her younger sister who was just this child, basically, that she probably ran off with a horny hitchhiker, which doesn't really even make any sense because if he was a hitchhiker, how would he have run off with her? You know what I'm so it, It's just strange behavior of this Robert Simpson to show up at her house making allegations against Kelvin Bowman, it was, in my personal opinion, it was deflection. Um, during the search, it was reported that search dogs, like I said, it had rained very heavily, but they said that search dogs did pick up her scent near the road leading to Clingman's Dome, and that was where the scent ended. So, but did they not say that the school bus was parked in the Clingman's Dome parking lot? So it's possible that, yes, the dog picked up her scent there, but could it have been that she had been there earlier? I don't know if it was a different path or road, but that was the only trace of her that they ever found was that that the dogs supposedly picked up her scent in that area. And that was where everything just kind of went cold. And um, 
it just, you know, some people speculated that she was picked up by someone. Abducted is the word that the FBI used. Um, I just don't know. I mean, it's possible that she got into the car with someone trusting that she was getting a ride, but it's also possible that um, she never made it out of that park, uh, you know, on her of her own will. Um, Robert Simpson's behavior was very strange because it was said that he, he and Trini were friends and that they had even spent some time together outside of school. Um, no one really ever said they were boyfriend and girlfriend, but like he would pick her up in his car and they would go for rides. So I don't know. Maybe he wanted more from her and she refused. But if it wasn't for that comb and that necklace and that jewelry turning up, I would say that she probably wandered off, got lost on the trail, tried to make her way out to um, a roadway or something. Maybe she was picked up by a stranger and given a ride, and that person did something to her. But that does not explain the jewelry. It's even possible that she wandered off the trail and got lost and stumbled down a ravine and down into a, a, a waterfall or something, and, you know, her remains have just never been found. Um, just like Dennis Martin, who went missing in the Smoky Mountains, whose remains have never been found. But I have to keep going back to the jewelry. And is it possible that this this so-called friend of hers, this classmate, um, gave the jewelry to this other girl? I, I'm... I'm scratching my head as to why the police did not bring her and this other boy into um, interrogation. Why did they not question them? They were minors, yes, but five years after her disappearance, her father was interviewed by the Knoxville News Sentinel. The Eagle Scout and former Boy Scout Scoutmaster expressed appreciation for for everyone that came out to search and for all that the FBI and searchers had done. He also expressed disappointment that the school district had not had stricter policies to protect the students. He thought that one adult chaperone for 40 students was not enough, and that's true. The FBI agreed with Gibson's conclusion but it wasn't because of what she left behind, it was because of what she didn't leave behind. And all of the searching that was done for her, not one scrap of fabric could be found. Nothing linked to the clothing that she was wearing. Her parents believed that she was abducted. I know from my viewpoint looking at this, this, I, I, I repeat myself once again, this jewelry, there was a reason why she paid $600 for a sapphire ring. And this was supposedly the first time she had ever worn this ring. She would not, if she was going to run off, if she had it planned that she was going to run off, she would not have spent $600 on a ring. She would have taken that money plus the $2,000 that she had at home. And she would have pulled that money, taken that money with her to get a bus ticket, a plane ticket, or whatever it was she, you know, or just a hotel room and someplace to, to stay until she got to where she was going. Because I just do not see her taking this ring that she had just bought she had worked for that money to buy this ring. Why would she take that money, buy this ring, and then take it off her finger and hand it to another classmate and then disappear with this guy's jacket on? But the only thing with that theory, the only problem that I have with that theory is where is she? Where is her 
remains where is this man's jacket they didn't disappear into thin air and in the amount of time whether it was 30 minutes or an hour or two or three hours even however long those students were out there on those trails how far could they have gotten with a body so that's problem number one I have with my own theory she had intentions of enrolling in college she knew what she wanted to do with her future her parents were planning on helping her to purchase a car in the next few months when she turned 16 I don't think this was a girl who was just going through any kind of crisis in her life and I don't think that she had a boyfriend or that she was in any kind of trouble that would lead her to run off so I keep going back to the jewelry and I think that the police the FBI and anyone else involved in investigating this dropped the ball on that jewelry they should have been pounding their fists in front of these two students until one of them fessed up the theories that they have on this this is the FBI's theories Trini was abducted from the Forney Ridge Trail intersects with the Appalachian Trail and she was taken out of the park another theory is that she followed the Appalachian Trail by mistake made her way to Clingman, Clingman's Dome and then went down the road where she was abducted it's always about being abducted he could have killed her before that hid her body away just long enough until he was able to go back out there get someone with a truck or a car or whatever and go back out there and get her body and remove it from the park now that's a that's a that's a long shot theory but it's not unheard of so I, I would say that it's possible that her family gave DNA like I said when this took place there was no such thing as DNA but over the years later maybe when they started having these Jed match and some of these other uh, databases came to be they may have said let's give our DNA in case there's a possibility that she did run off that she's out there somewhere married with kids and maybe someday we could be reunited with her I doubt that very, very much. Um, or they could have said, let's give our DNA and in the uh, possibility that remains are found and they want to match those remains to somebody. So this is from Web Sleuths and this is from June of 2020. The relationship was strained between Robert Simpson and the Gibson family partly because of questioning of Simpson came to a halt after his father intervened and because he could not provide an adequate explanation as to where he was when Trini disappeared add to this strange comments he made and the fact that he had her calm he was hanging around her residence screening phone calls without permission he had been tasked with looking out for her on the trip Simpson knew he was a suspect so he clammed up and distanced himself from the family so it's reported that her older brother was best friends with this Robert Simpson and that her brother asked her his friend to kind of look out for her on the trip on the field trip now this person this theory was is that there was no police report ever filed about the missing jewelry but I read that the parents had told the police that it was being talked about at the school that the girl had the ring that she was seen with the ring and that they requested the ring to be given back and in one story is reported that they never got the jewelry back 
he tells her father that she gave him the comb to hold. So the theory, the, the question here was, why didn't he say to the family, hey, she gave me her comb, I've still got it if you want it back. It's almost like a souvenir, in my opinion. But I came across this story because I was looking to see if there were any remains found in the area around North Carolina and Tennessee, possibly as far as South Carolina or Kentucky in the opposite direction that maybe were found sometime after 1977 that might match this young woman, you know, a girl of that age. And I came upon this story. Remains found in 1985 have now been identified as a missing teenager who was missing from 300 miles away. Tracy Sue Walker. Skeletal remains found decades ago in a remote Tennessee valley have now been identified as a missing girl. Tracy Sue Walker was a teenager when she disappeared in 1978 near Lafayette, Indiana. Almost four decades after the discovery, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation announced the unidentified remains are now those of Tracy Sue Walker. Questions still linger in this case. As of Tuesday, August the 30th, investigators continue to seek clues about what happened and how she died and how she got to Tennessee. The case came upon the state's radar in April of 1985 when human remains were found in a remote part of Campbell County, which is roughly 70 miles northwest of Knoxville. Now, I can imagine when these remains were found and it was announced that teenage uh, female remains were found very, very close to the hometown of um, Trini Gibson. I'm sure that her family was very, if her mother and brother are still living, I couldn't find that anymore. I, I looked, I was trying to find out, but only because I wanted to know if they had been interviewed recently about this or if they were, you know, still continuing to search for answers. This also in mind, is it possible that whoever, whatever happened to Trini, could have also been the same person that, you know, I mean, she goes missing from Tennessee this girl goes missing um, from Indiana and is found in Tennessee. Let's see, what day was she last seen? It doesn't say the date. It just says 1978. So this would have been after Trini Gibson disappeared. Um, if the theory is in the minds of the law enforcement and the FBI that Trini was abducted, I would be looking in Lafayette, Indiana area where this girl lived because it's possible that whoever this man was that picked, her, picked Trini up and abducted her drove to Indiana, disposed of uh, Trini's remains, hung around the area, came upon this young woman, abducted her, and drove back to Knoxville. You know? Stranger things. In 2007, the case started to gain steam. The remains were sent for identification, and a DNA profile was created. The case was revisited in 2013 before a lab called Ortham reportedly stepped in to help with forensic genealogy testing. The company later shared that someone living in Indiana could be a relative of the girls of the remains. Using that information, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation 
located potential family members in Lafayette, Indiana. A TBI agent made contact with those individuals and it was confirmed that they had a family member go missing in 1978. After further DNA testing, they reported that the remains had been identified and that this decades-long mystery had been solved. Well, solved as of who she was, but what's the circumstances as to how she came to be 300 miles away? It's a case that investigators never gave up on. Um, we now know her identity. Officials continue searching for answers. If anyone who spent any time with her or has any details are asked to call 1-800-824-3463. This is just a theory, but this has been proven to be true in other cases that truck drivers, and I don't want to say nothing bad about truck drivers, but sometimes truck drivers travel these routes, and is it possible that this is a case here that this truck drive, that there could have been a truck driver traveling along between Knoxville and um, Indiana? Because the Smoky Mountains National Park, um, while it is a you know, a national park. It's also surrounded by small towns like Bryson City, Cherokee, North Carolina, Maggie Valley, Gatlinburg. They don't want to give out too much information because they are still working on trying to solve this case. It's clear that the person who left her body had unique knowledge of this wooded spot. He is... Um, off of a rocky pitted road that served as a haul road by Elk Valley truck drivers. Found along with the remains was a cheap necklace. So she was unclothed. Secrets tend to stay in the hills, as they say. There are people there that I believe hold the key to this, and we have spoken to many people in Elk Valley and will continue to do so. It's another um, mystery, basically. Did they find any uh, DNA from another person or was there any remains? If she was unclothed, as, it, as they suggest, um, and the reason that I say that is because they said the only thing found with her body was a necklace. So I'm assuming that she was unclothed. The reason that I included the Tracy Walker story here in this story about Trina Gibson is because they were both similar in age. And um, they were both... One, one girl went missing from the Knoxville area. The other girl was found in the Knoxville area. My question was, is it possible that someone did abduct Trina Gibson and maybe was the same person who brought Tracy Walker to the area? Now, I, there's no proof of that. I don't know if they found any, any DNA whatsoever on these remains of Tracy Walker. I haven't seen anything about that, but it was just a question. It was just something that it was just a, a possibility. This Tracy Walker was found on a high road that was known to be used by logging and coal uh, trucks. And so is it possible that someone was hauling logs up and down, you know? I, I don't know. It's just a question that I wanted to pose, I guess, to get people to thinking, you know, to get people to question that possibility. Both of these cases are equally tragic, and whatever happened to Trina Gibson to this day is still unproven. All the theories, my own theories, the FBI, the family... Why the question that I wondered is why the national parks were resistant to bringing in cadaver dogs. 
this girl could very simply have fallen and um, you know why would they say we're resistant to bringing in cadaver dogs it's all because of publicity it's just like I was talking about in the case of the two women who were murdered in the Shenandoah National Park they um, the National Parks didn't want publicity brought to the possibility that there was a murderer inside their park and at that time when Trina Gibson went missing I don't even think anyone was suggesting a murder I think that they wanted to bring in cadaver dogs just simply because they thought there was a possibility that she could have died from exposure or fallen and been injured but the fact that it rained so much it had been raining and the weather and the ground and everything was already wet add on top of that that it started to rain that same night that she went missing this is exactly what happened in the Dennis Martin case and it rained so badly that night and into the next day that they had to call off searches for him because of uh, visibility and just the possibility that someone could be injured themselves which is what happened in the Trina Gibson uh, search at least two people were injured due to the wet terrain but whatever happened to her is still a mystery to this day and um, it's a there's a possibility we have seen cases be solved 60 70 years later um, there's a possibility that this case may be solved one day her remains may turn up somewhere whether in the park or somewhere along you know some other area like I said at the beginning of this rather long video and I apologize for the length but it's as though if, if it were not for the fact that this girl's comb and ring and, and jewelry um, supposedly in the hands of one of the other students I don't know about the ring I'm assuming that if they took the time to take the necklace from her they would have also taken this expensive ring um, if it was not for that I would say that this girl was abducted or something very so, either way something very sinister took place because this was not a child that just up and ran away and um, I don't know if anyone will ever come clean I don't know if over the years these other students it's rumored that there was a group of them who collaborated to, to keep quiet but people are known to talk and especially teenagers and it seems to me almost impossible that over this many years no one would have come out and said okay I'm gonna tell the real story here so I'm, I'm just not sure but this is a mystery this is one of the bigger mysteries and I just wanted to tell these two cases together because I believe that there's always a possibility of a serial killer and um, Trina Gibson could have met up with someone along the road once she made it to uh, Clingman's Dome she could have been very trusting young teenage girl and and fearful of getting in trouble with the school and her parents she may have asked someone for help and trusted the wrong person I just I don't know but I appreciate you all for taking the time to watch